Well, I have a question. I guess I'd like to know a little bit more about why you specifically chose the title, the master and the emissary. And yeah, that, that's to, uh, in an attempt to explain what I believe to be the relationship between the two yeah. brain hemispheres. Um, that like most other things in life, they're unequal and asymmetrical. And that one of the brain hemispheres sees more than the other. That is the one that I've designated the master mm -hmm. and is the right hemisphere. Mm -hmm. That's but a weird inversion because people often think of the left hemisphere as the one that's like dominant. They do, they do. Traditionally that's been the case. Uh, but um, as is becoming ever clearer, the right hemisphere, ha this has been a, a real steep learning curve for some people, but the right hemisphere is in many ways more reliable, sees more, understands more than the left hemisphere, mm -hmm. which is like a, a sort of high-functioning high bureaucrat in a way. Mm -hmm. And the, the idea of the story was simply that certain matters needed to be delegated, not only because, as it were, the master couldn't do everything. He needed an emissary to go abroad and do some of it. But also that he must not get involved with a certain point of view, otherwise he'd lose what it was that he did see. So mm -hmm. that's what I'm really saying there, is that there's a good reason uh, why, evolutionarily speaking, the two brain hemispheres are separate. And when you say it doesn't get involved, what's the advantage of, of that, that detachment from the involvement? Well, it's that um, Ramoni Cajal, who you know yep. is a great histopathologist, yep. Um, one of his findings was that in primates there are more inhibitory neurons than in any other animals and there are more in humans than, than in any other primate. And um, there are many that, more... And that's propor speaking proportionally. Proportionally mm -hmm. and there are more kinds as well. So mm. we think that about 25% of the entire um, cortex is, is inhibitory. Right. So it's a very strong effect. And the corpus callosum seems to be um, very largely, in the end, inhibiting function in the other hemisphere. And that is, I think, because over time, the two hemispheres have had to specialize. Uh, there are reasons why actually it can't be, I'm not going to go into now, yeah. but I was talking about um, just a few days ago at the evolutionary psychiatry um, meeting. But there are reasons why the corpus callosum has had to become more selective and to inhibit quite a lot of what's going on in the other hemisphere because it enables the two to do distinct things. Mm -hmm. And of course they have to work together, but usually good teamwork doesn't mean everyone trying to do the same role. Right. So differentiation is very important for two elements to work together. And inhibition is one way of doing that. So effectively the two takes on the world, if you like, that the hemispheres have are not easily compatible right. um, and we're not aware of that because at a level below consciousness there's a meta control center that is bringing them together so in ordinary experience we don't feel we're in two different worlds but effectively mm. we are mm -hmm. and they have different qualities and different goals different values different different um, takes on what is important in the in the world and what meaning or whatever it might have so so let me let me ask you about I, i've got I've developed a conceptual scheme for for thinking about the relationship between the two hemispheres, and I'm kind of I've been curious about what you think about it and how it might map on to or not your your ideas. So I've been really interested in the orienting reflex, and right. discovered by Sokolov, I think, back in about 1962. Right, he was a student of Lurius, and the orienting reflex is manifested when something, at least in their terminology, something unpredictable happened. I've thought much more recently that it's actually when something undesired happened happens and right. the laboratory constraints um, obscured that and that turned out to actually be important but right um, so and I, I kind of put together the ideas of the orienting reflex with some of the things I learned from Jung Jung's observations on the function of art and dreams right. so imagine that you have a conceptual scheme laid out right. and we could say that it's 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 linguistically mediated it's enforced on the world and then there are exceptions to that to that conceptual scheme, and yes. those are anomalies, those yes. are the anomalies. things that are unexpected, and the orienting reflex orients you towards those. Yes. And so those are things that aren't fitting properly in your conceptual scheme that you have to figure out. Yes. So the first thing you do is react, 
defensively, essentially, yes, because it yes. might be dangerous. Yes. And then your exploratory systems are activated. Yes. So, and the exploratory systems, first of all, are enhanced attention, just yes. from an intentional yes. perspective. But then, and this is where the art issue sort of creeps into it, it's, the idea would be something like the right hemisphere generates an imaginative landscape of possibility that could map that anomaly. So you can kind of experience that if yeah. it's at night, you know, like say yeah. you're sitting alone at night, it's two mm. or three in the morning, you're kind of tired, um, maybe you're in an unfamiliar place and there's a noise that happens that shouldn't happen in another room. Yeah. You can play with that. So for mm. example, if you open the door slightly and put your hand in to turn on the light mm. and you watch what happens, your mind will fill with imaginative representations of yes. what might be yes. in the room, yes. right? So it's like the, 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 the landscape of anomaly will be populated with yes. something like imaginative demons. Yes. And that's a first pass approximation. Yes. Yes. And it seems to me that that's a right hemispheric function. And then that as you explore further, that imaginative domain, which, which circumscribes what might be, is yes. constrained and constrained and constrained and constrained until you get what it actually is. Yes. And that's specialized and routinized. It's something yes. like that. Yes. Yes. Does that seem like a reasonable... What do you think about that? As I a love that for, idea? for a whole ro host of reasons. Um, one is you mentioned uh, defense, and one of the uh, ideas behind my hypothesis is that the right hemisphere is on the lookout for predators, right. wh whereas the left hemisphere is looking for prey. And th this has been confirmed in many species of both. I'd never heard that second part. Amphibians and mammals, yes. Um, uh, so when you're in left hemispheric mode, you're more in predator mode, and when you're in right hemispheric well, mode, it, it, you're more I in Well, I mean, of course, mode. we are not uh, lizards or toads or marmosets or whatever, but in animals, generally speaking, yeah. uh, this is the case. Getting and grasping, and after all, our left hemisphere is the one that controls sure, the grasping sure. hand, um, is left hemisphere, and uh, exploring, which you mentioned, yep. is more right hemisphere. And when the when a frontal function is deficient, um, people often go into automatic mode of the hand of that side. And with the left hand, it's usually exploratory motions, meaningless ones, but trying to explore the environment. And with the right hand, it's grasping pointlessly at things. So they, as it were, their automatic thing is with the with the left hand, the right hemisphere to explore, with the right hand, the left hemisphere to grasp. So right. when you said exploratory and you said defensive and you said also opening up to possibilities, these are all aspects of the way the right hemisphere, I often say the right hemisphere opens up to possibility, right. whereas the left hemisphere wants to close down to a certainty. Right, right. right. And you need That's both a chaos of these. and order issue. Chaos right. and order. Yeah, yeah, exactly. and, and, you know, I loved in, in your talk, you talked about... Um, a chaos and, and order, but if I may say so, you seemed, and maybe you'd like to gloss that a little, you seem to suggest that it would be good, we can't get rid of chaos, but you seem to imply that it would be better if we could, whereas my view is that chaos and order uh, are necessary to one another, and there is a proper sort of um, harmony or yeah. balance. Well, yeah, well, okay, that, I mean, I think that's, that's as deep a question as you could possibly ask, I would say, in good. some sense. I mean, <laughs> some of the I would say there's a central theological issue there. And yes. the issue there is, the, you know, in Genesis, the proper environment of humanity is construed as a garden. Yes. And so I see that as the optimal balance of chaos and order. Because right. nature is, is, flourishes and is yes. prolific and is chaotic. Yes. And then if you add harmony to that, you yes. have a garden. Yes. So you live in the garden, you're supposed to tend the garden. Okay, so now the garden is created, it's a walled space, because yes. Eden is a walled space, it's yes. a paradisa, it's a, it's a walled garden. That's it. Now the thing is, as soon as you make a wall, you try to keep what's outside out, but you can't, because mm. the boundaries between things are permeable. So if you're going to have reality, and you're going to have a bounded space, you're going to have a snake in the garden. Yes. Now then the question is, well, what the hell should you do about that? Should yes. you make the walls so high that no snake can possibly yes. get in? Or should, or should you allow for the possibility of snakes but make yourself strong enough so that you can contend with them? Yes. And I think there's, there's an answer there that goes deep to the question of even maybe why, theological question, of why God allowed evil to exist in the world. I agree with you. It's like, well, do you make people safe or strong? And yes. strong is better. And safe might not be commensurate with being. Like It might not be no, possible to no. exist and to be safe. Well, so, uh, our existence is predicated on the fact that we die, so well, it's well, never safe. Well, it's uh, certainly bounded, right? <laughs> yes. and, yeah, yeah, I mean, yes. it, it, it's inevitably in, 
wrapped up with yes. that sort of finitude. Yes. So there's this old, there's a lovely, lovely Jewish idea, an ancient idea. Yes. It's one of the most profound ideas I've ever come across. Yeah. And so it's a kind of a Zen cone, and, and here it is, is that, um, so it's a question about the classic attributes of God, mm. omniscient, omnipresent, and omnipotent. Mm. What does a being with those three attributes lack? Mm. What kind of question is that? And the answer is limitation. Yeah. And the second answer is that's the justification for being. Yeah. Is that the unlimited lacks the limited. Exactly. And so exactly. the limited is us. For anything to come into existence, there needs to be an element of resistance. And so things are never predicated on one pole of what is always a dipole. Right. Um, everything is, has that uh, dipole Yeah, it's like a structure. prerequisite for being. Uh, uh, it is, mm -hmm. and it's imaged in the yin-yang idea. Um, but it seems to me very important, because in our culture we often seem to suppose that certain things are just good and other things are just bad, mm -hmm. and it would be good if we could get rid of the bad ones. But mm -hmm. actually, by pursuing certain good things that are good within measure too far, they become bad right. and so forth. Right. But I, I, let's go back to your anomaly thing, because uh, Ramachandran calls the right hemisphere the anomaly yes, detector. Yes, yes. And so I think that that's a very important point, because there are two ways you can react to an anomaly. One is to, um, and both have to be explored, one is to try and uh, prove that it's not really an anomaly and therefore you can carry on with things as normal. Yes, and the other is that's the hopeful, that's, th that's that, what you hope will happen. That, that's, a, that, that's, the, that's the typical left hemisphere approach, it doesn't want anything to have to shift. Yeah. Um, and quite reasonably, you don't want to be chaotically shifting if you're onto a good yeah, thing. Yeah, it's too stressful. Exactly, exactly. It takes too much work. It, and you might actually be mistaken. So, yeah, so yes, the, the, in a way it's perfectly correct to be wary, but it's not correct to be so wary that you blot out anomalies. And there's a lot of evidence, as yeah, I'm sure you know, that the left the hemisphere other. simply blots out everything that doesn't fit with its tape. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mm -hmm. see it, actually, mm -hmm. at all. Mm -hmm. right, right. So it's, there's a hugely important element in the right hemisphere going, hang on, but there may be another way of thinking that will accommodate this better. And actually good science needs, yes, to be sceptical about anomalies, otherwise there would be chaos, but it also needs to be able to shift yeah. when, when an anomaly is right. you know, large enough. Right, right. Uh, or, or there are quite a lot of them and they don't really fit very well into this. Exactly, yeah. yes, yes. So there's, a, there's another observation that Jung made, which I love, I love this observation. He was trying to account for radical personality transformation. Right. And so his idea was this, and I think it's, it's, it's commensurate with the ideas of inhibition between the two hemispheres. So let's imagine the left is habitually inhibiting the function of the right to keep fear under control. It does that all sorts of ways. But, so imagine that the right is um, reacting to anomalies and it's aggregating them. Okay, the left can't deal with them, so the right is aggregating anomalies. And maybe that's starting to manifest itself in nightmarish dreams, for example. It's like, oh, these anomalies are piling up. It's indication that you're mm -hmm. on mm -hmm. shifting sand. Mm -hmm. well, so then imagine that the right hemisphere aggregates anomalies, and then it starts to detect patterns in the anomalies. And so now it starts to generate what you might consider a counter-hypothesis exactly. to the left's exactly. hypothesis. If that counter-hypothesis gets to the point where the total sum, in some sense, of the anomalies plus the already mapped territory can be mapped by that new pattern, mm. then at some point it will shift, shift yes. and the person will kick into a new yes. personality configuration. Yes. Yes. It's like a Piagetian stage transition, except more dramatic. It is, and what a Piagetian stage transition is also like, and subsumes both, is Hegelian uh, Aufhebung, the idea that um, a thing is opposed by something else, but when, it, when there is a synthesis, it's not that one of them is annihilated. Right. They're both transformed and taken up into the new whole, right. which embraces what before right, looked, is, like, okay. looked like an op okay. opposition. Right, right. Yes. Okay, so here, here's a question for you. you know, mm. um, when I read Thomas Kuhn, I was reading Piaget at the same time, and I knew that Piaget was aware of Kuhn's work, by the way. And um, the problem I had with Kuhn and the interpretation, interpreters of Kuhn is they don't seem to get something, who, who, who interpret Kuhn as a moral relativist in some sense. Yeah. They don't seem to get the idea of um, increased generalizability of, of plan. So let's say I have a theory and a bunch of anomalies accrue and I have to wipe out the theory. And so then I wipe out the theory and I incorporate the anomalies and now I have another theory. So yes. that's a descent into chaos. That's my estimation. That's okay. the old story. 
So the anomaly, yes. disruption is the mythical descent into chaos. Yes. And then you reconfigure the yes. theory with the chaos and you come up with a better theory. Yes. Okay, the, the question is why is it better? Mm. And the answer is, well, it accounts for everything that the previous theory accounted for, plus, plus the anomalies. Exactly. So there's progress. Always, yeah. yes. exactly. And yes. So, but Kuhn is often read as stating that there is no progress, that you know, there's incommensurate paradigms and you have yes. to just shift between yes. them, but, yes. but there isn't... There isn't cumulative knowledge in some sense. Well, I think one thing that one we probably would both agree about is that we don't buy the story that, um, you know, because nothing can be demonstrated definitively, utterly, to be the case, there is no truth. I mean, I think we both believe that there are truths, things that are truer than other things. Mm -hmm. And indeed, if... if we certainly if, act that way. Well, well, we couldn't even talk, right. could we, if we didn't? Uh, yeah, exactly. Um, and even to say that um, there are no truths is itself a truth statement, mm -hmm. which is that it's truer than the statement there are truths. So everybody automatically has truths, whether they know it or not. Yeah, but, but it's because you... Well, you, you said why. I yeah. don't think... It's not only that you can't talk... You can't even see, because no. right? you don't know how to point you your eyes. You wouldn't know how to discriminate what's coming into your brain at right, all. Right. So it's inevitable. Um, uh, I think we would agree about that. But I, I think there may be a slight point of difference between us in that I'm um, very willing to uh, embrace the idea of uncertainty. Mm -hmm. And I, 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 I may be wrong, perhaps you could expand on that. But sometimes you come across as as a man who has certainties that... Well, it's a peculiar kind of certainty. <laughs> I'm certain that standing on the border between order and chaos is a good idea. Good. And that's a weird exactly. certainty, eh? Because, exactly. Yeah, yeah. That, that's that, you that, need that, to that, be in the sort of slightly unstable position. Yeah. Yes. You have to, you have to be, um, what would you say, encountering as much uncertainty as you can voluntarily tolerate. Yes. And I think that's equivalent to Vygotsky's zone of proximal development. I, I'm and sure I also, that's right. So, so when we talked a little bit earlier about the idea of an instinct for meaning. Yes. So I think what meaning is, it's, it's, it's the elaborated form of the orienting reflex. But what meaning does, its function, its biological function, which I think is more real in some sense than any other biological function, is to tell you when you're in the place where you've balanced the stability, let's say, of your left hemisphere systems with the exploratory capacity of your right, so that not only are you master of your domain, but you're expanding that domain simultaneously. Yes, yes. And when you, I think that when you're there, yes. and it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a kind of a metaphysical place yes. in some yes. sense, that you're imbued with a sense of meaning and purpose, and yes. that's an indication that yes. you've actually optimized your neurological function. Yes, and perhaps we could gloss the idea of purpose because I think there's um, um, a difference between... Uh, people get very confused, I think, about the idea of purpose, particularly um, whether there's a problem that suggesting there is a purpose, and I believe there is a purpose, or there are purposes to the cosmos, not just to my mm -hmm. daily life. Mm -hmm. Um, suggests that somehow it's all been predetermined by God. But this is to misunderstand the nature of time, that there are time static slices and God is there and he's sorted it all out and the whole thing's just unfolding. As Bergson says, like a, f a lady's fan being unfurled. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. extremely boring and, and, mm -hmm. and, and, and an entirely static and non-creative universe. Mm -hmm. But actually something is at stake. Things are unfolding. They have overall a direction, but actually exactly what that direction is isn't known. Mm -hmm. That's what it looks like to it, me. It, and it's a fool who says anything positive about the nature of God, but, but I, I'm not convinced that God is omniscient and omnipotent either. I think God is in the process of is becoming. God is not only just becoming, but is becoming, if mm -hmm. you see what I mean. Yeah, so being and becoming. At the uh, same more time. becoming. I think more that becoming. Be becoming is the important thing. Mm -hmm. Why do you think that? I mean, it's, it, it's, it's also a strange that? segue. I mean, I, I'm not criticizing, but I'm curious. What, what drove you to that conclusion? An awful lot of things, really. Um, I think that everything is, is a process. In fact, I'm writing a book called There Are No Things. Oh, what and, are there instead? Uh, there are processes. Yes. And there are patterns. Patterns. Yes. That's why I think music is so powerful. Music is one of the most mysterious and wonderful things in the universe. And I don't think it was at all foolish of people to have thought that the you know, planetary motions were in some no, way like... No, it's not at all like, foolish. No, no. No, it's no, a great insight. kind of music. I think it is a very important insight. Well, but, music, you know, I've thought, and I've said this in public lectures, that music is the most representative of the arts. 
It because the world is made out of patterns. <laughs> yes. And music describes how those patterns should be arranged. You're using representative in a very different way. I know, I know. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. I mean, but, yes, you know, it yes. depends on what you mean by, by representative. And what yes, you, yes. So it's representing the ultimate reality of the cosmos. Well, so I would like to say presentative, in that it's not representing anything. It is actually, when we're in the presence of music, something is coming into being which is, which is at the core of the whole cosmic mm -hmm. process. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that's why I, people love music. I, I, they do, and I mean, I'm, it's hardly any originality in the idea because lots of physicists say this: that the sort of the, the movements of atoms and the movements of planets and so forth uh, are more like a dance or more right. like music than they are like things bumping into. Right, right, yeah. right, 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 right. Um, so, uh, See, because, I thought of things as patterns that people have made into tools. I agree with you, and tools are what the left hemisphere is always looking for. Mm -hmm. It's always looking for something to right, grasp. Right. It, it reifies processes that, if you, it's all a matter of time. Every single thing, including the mountain behind my house, if you were able to, which is billions of years old, if you were able to take, um, a, as it were, a series of, uh, like a, a time lapse mm -hmm. camera, mm -hmm. you'd see the thing morphing and changing right. and flowing. Right. Everything flows as. Heraclitus once said, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. everything flows, it's just a question of over the time period that you it's consider it. It's a question of tempo. It's a question mm -hmm. of the tempo. Yeah, and so taking time out of things and considering them in the abstract, deracinated from context, particularly from the flow and from the context of time, changes them into something else. Mm -hmm. And I think that what, uh, in brief, what Plato has done and what a lot of the history of more recent Christianity has done is to thingify uh, God mm -hmm. and heaven, perfect states mm. that are unaltered and so on. And I think that it is an ever, ever more wonderfully self, uh, self-exploring, self-actualizing uh, process mm. that requires a degree of opposition. Mm -hmm. You know, as a stream, in order to have the movement and the, and the, the, the eddies and patterns in it, I've it, had intimations it has like to be that constrained. about death. Death. Like when, when I've experienced... And it's hard to describe these experiences, but when, when I've contemplated death deeply, it has struck me as a, as a fundamental repair mechanism. Like it's part of the mechanism by which new things that are better are brought into being. Absolutely. And I mean, you see that in your own being, because yes. of course, without death, you couldn't live. Right? Yes. Because you're dying. The things about you that aren't right, even at a physiological level, yes. are dying all the time. They now, are. Unfortunately, you also completely die, which seems yes. to be a bit yes. on the unfortunate side. But well, more, more cosmically yes. speaking, it does seem to me that death is the, is, it's, I don't know, man, I, it's, I've had intuitions or intimations that death is the friend of being. And that's, like, it's hard to get my head around that. But I, I completely agree with you. And indeed, that's been said by, you know, many, many wiser people than, than myself. Um, Maybe even than yourself. I would, I would <laughs> suspect so. Hopefully but, so. No, but I mean, I think that that's right, that death is predicated on life. But also that it shouldn't be seen as a, a sort of uh, something that's the negative. It's, it's a necessary stage in the process of being becoming what it is. Mm -hmm. And See, I, since I, I, everything is ramified, since nothing is just isolated, yep. you and I may look as though, feel as though, but as you often eloquently say, we all have a history and we, so we have, in time, we, we, we come from a place, but also as a culture, we have history. We can't detach ourselves from it. We're expressions of it. Mm -hmm. But we're also inevitably dependent, as all organisms are, on the environment. Where I end and where the, right, quote, right. environment begins is a, I don't like the word environment, actually, no. for nature, which it's suggests something that's concept. always being born, whereas mm -hmm. environment says something around me from which I'm separated. Right, right, but, right. but anyway, all of that is and connected. And opposed to. Yes, yes. So I would see us as like an eddy in a stream mm -hmm. or like a wave in the sea that is never separate. Schrodinger the, talked uh, about life as well. well things, right? it, yeah. I mean, the, the, the coming together of physics with, with, this, uh, with a, a process philosophy are, mm -hmm. are very strong. So when does that book come out? When I finish writing oh. it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I, I'm very worried that um, it's getting bigger and it's, you know, all the time I'm writing it, I'm seeing more and more of things that I I'm really must get to know more about mm -hmm. and, so, and it's an ever receding um, well it's the danger of a book that's, I know. That, 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 that aims at something fundamental because you never run you never hit the proper boundaries that's it I need that wall mm -hmm. mm -hmm. <laughs> yes yeah well I, I also had experiences I would say of 
that when I was trying to understand I, their imaginative experiences when I was trying to understand, let's say, the necessity of evil, mm. you know, because that's also a fundamental theological conundrum and yeah. you know, a metaphysical conundrum. Yeah. How, why is it that being is constituted such that evil is allowed to exist? Yeah. Right? It's Ivan Karamazov's uh, what critique of, of Alyosha's um, Christianity, essentially. Yeah. What kind of God would allow for this sort of thing? It's the think, ancient question. Yeah, it's an ancient question. And I mean, part of what I thought, what I've, I mean, I thought about the adversarial element to that, which is that you need a challenge. Because you don't, you're not forced to bring forth what you could bring forth without a challenge. And the greater the thing that you're supposed to bring forth, the greater the challenge has to be. Yeah. So you need an adversary, something yes. like that. Yes. But then I also thought that um, it would, it's possible that, that that being, being requires limitation. You might say optimal being requires free choice. I know I'm going through a lot of things quickly. Free choice requires the real distinction between good and evil. It does. Without that you don't have choice. Well, so maybe it's possible to set up a world where evil is a possibility, but where it isn't something that has to be manifest. You know, where, where it's an option open to you, and a real option, and it has to be, and a challenge that was presented to you, but it's something that you cannot you cannot move towards if you so if you so desire, and that seems to me to be something like the ethical ethical requirement. That that's the fundamental ethical requirement to avoid evil. Well, I'm sure that you're... doesn't mean it shouldn't exist. That's not the same issue. No, it isn't. It isn't. Um, and I, I I wonder, one could recast it as the need for otherness. I mean, God needs something other. And that other, if it's not going to be just part of God, has got to be free. Otherwise, there will be no creation. I mean, mm. the, 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 the nature that there is something other than, than God, um, it may in the end come from and come back to right. that God, right. that, or that divine essence, or that whatever. But there's a wonderful... Yeah, something I can't figure out either. Like, in, in the Christian idea, there's the end of time where... The, the evil is separated from God forever. Yes. And I think about that as a, I, a yes. metaphysical... Well, you might think, if, it, if it's a form of... Like, imagine it's a form of perfection, a form of striving for perfection. You fragment yourself, yes. you challenge yourself, yes. you throw what's not worthy into the fire, yes. everlasting, something yes. like that. And so what, it, what you end up with retained is much better than what you started with through the trials, something like that. Well, that sounds a bit like the dialectical process that we've been talking about. Right. And you have alluded to a couple of very good um, Jewish um, myths. And there's one in the Lurian Kabbalah um, about the creation, which I don't know if you know it, but it's, it's absolutely riveting to me. Um, the idea is that the primary being, Ein Zof, the ground of all being, mm -hmm. um, needs something other to come into being, mm -hmm. the creation. Mm -hmm. And that creation, what does that aims off do? What is his first act? Is it to stretch out a hand and make something? Not a bit. The first act is to withdraw, to create a place in which there can be something other than aims off. Mm -hmm. And so the, the first stage is called Sim Sum, and it sounds negative, as so many creative things do, withdrawal. And then in that space, there are vessels and a spark comes out of Ein Zof and falls into the vessels and they all shatter. Mm -hmm. And that's called uh, Sheferat Hakeli, yes, the shattering yes, of the vessels. Yes, I've read across that in Jung. Yeah, yeah. Right, yes. Yeah. And then there is the third stage, repair, in which um, what has just been fragmented is yeah. restored into something greater. Mm -hmm. And so this process carries on. And it's, in my terms, very like what happens with the hemispheres. The right hemisphere is the one that is first accepting, it is sort of actively receptive, if you can put it that way, to whatever is new. You were talking about Elkin yep. and Goldberg and so on. Um, and then whatever that is, is then sort of processed by the left hemisphere at the next stage into categories. So it's a bit of that and yep. try to understand it. But of course, whatever it is, is much bigger than any of the categories. So they all break down mm -hmm. and it gets restored in the right hemisphere into a new whole, um, the, the tikkun, the repair. Mm -hmm. That's and, tikkun, and, right? T i k k u n. T i k k u n. Right, 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 right. And, and you know, the, the the kind of um, 
easy way of thinking about it is learning a piece of music. You're first of all attracted to it as a whole. You then realise that you need to practice that piece at bar 28 and you realise mm -hmm. that you know at, at, at bar 64 there's a return to the dominant or something and uh, then actually when you go on stage you've got to um, just forget all about that but it's not that that work was lost it's just that it's no longer present. Right.